My apologies for our two minutes late start, ladies and gentlemen, as I welcome you all and welcome our guest, Mr. Freddy Kisu, to Room 592, where we unleash the truth. It is serious times, ladies and gentlemen. We all know the backdrop of where we are, why we are here 136 days after elections without any results. We do know that today has been a very long day with the court case going on and on and on. And we would have seen the legal luminaries um, would have expressed themselves this time once again in front of the general public. Um, we would have seen how impressive or not their arguments were. And ladies and gentlemen, just before I allow ourselves to listen to the wise counsel on, on, on analysis of Mr. Freddie Kisun, I just want to share this with you. Um, this analogy, ladies and gentlemen, that, you know, uh, this court case is reminiscent of a position where imagine a thief that has been caught red-handed in the act of stealing. But this thief argues that because the act of stealing is incomplete, it is not illegal. Number two, the thief wants you to accept that because you saw him stealing and because it is not illegal, you must allow it. And number three, the current position is that the thief wants you to go back to sleep so that they could complete the act of stealing. And then when you wake, it's up to you to catch them or to find them or not. That's a perfect analogy of where we are, ladies and gentlemen. But, but stealing is stealing intent. In, in, in crime, they often look at the intent, the motive for criminal action, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, it's a sad night for Guyana as we continue to regurgitate verbiage in our desires to prolong this election saga that we have here. Mr. Kisun, welcome, sir. Welcome to Room 592 once again. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. I'm always here. Thank you, Freddie. And my co-host, Mr. Leonard Gildari, sir. Um, it has been a long day, and I know at one stage both you and I and the Kaito radio crew were worried about whether the court, uh, court case would go on, and we won't get to have this discussion here tonight, but thankfully we are on our way, sir. Five. Your thoughts of today's proceedings? <laughs> very, very much of five hours or a little more than that, and of course, uh, a lot of people, uh, they were finding plenty of things humorous, people falling <laughs> asleep, all kinds of things happening. But it is what it is in the courts, and so our good Chief Justice is ready to come out with a ruling on Monday at 4. She said uh, originally at, uh, uh, it would have been sometime on Sunday with a ruling, but she said uh, that it was so a uh, lot of nice arguments coming out today, and that's my words, um, that she's decided to push it back until Monday. Uh, five hours, I think there's a lot to digest there. I can understand the task that she has at hand. Great. And so let us get into our discussion with Mr. Kisun then. Mr. Kisun, if you don't mind, without getting into uh, the more analysis that I would want us to get into, um, your thoughts, if you might have listened to any of the court um, arguments today, so your knee-jerk reaction. Well, it's a pattern. Uh, the court case uh, was perceived by the Americans to be the ultimate in absurdity, and I, I believe that court case is what brought on the sanctions because the court case is is fund is in fundamental ignorance, deliberate fundamental ignorance of what the Guyana's highest court of appeal court of appeal has adumbrated. So if you go to if you go to pursue an agenda of fundamental ignorance in each finality of legality then it's going to be no ending. So I think what the Americans said is that the CCJ has ruled, so they were waiting for the declaration by GCOM. And then came this court case, which is a total denial of the finality. Now, if you're going to go on doing that, and that is going to happen when this case reached the CCJ, I'm hoping it doesn't. I'm hoping on Tuesday, Father Singh does the, the decent thing. 
uh, call in the GCOM commission. If the, the PNC guys don't come, then the next day um, continue and make the declaration. But if this thing goes to the CCJ, what those people are going to do is what they have done with the CCJ. They're going to take a line and in depraved manner say this is what the line means. Therefore, we want to test this in court and say that they're going to go on doing that. I don't believe they are going to bow to the declaration because Granger has given it away. He said that he will adhere to GCOM's declaration if it's within the law. Now, if you look at Granger's um, um, depoma uh, or his approach to Guyanese jurisprudence, he doesn't accept definitive conclusions of court cases. When the, the, um, the Chief Justice had ruled, he said that is our interpretation. And then he did something that caused the diplomatic um, community in this country, every one of them, Mexico, Argentina, India, they were all there in addition to the, 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 the powerful Western countries. He, he called them at a meeting and said to them, the chairman of the Caribbean Court of Justice has ruled that I, as president, can escape the Carter article in the Constitution where the opposition has to nominate the chairman. And I can come up with a list of my own nominees and choose it. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I live all my life in Guyana, and I've seen, uh, and I've studied Caribbean politics, I've seen Caribbean leaders make really asinine mistakes but not mm -hmm. Forbes Burnham. For all his autocratic mentality, Burnham would never have done such a stupid thing. And mm -hmm. I, I, I would think that in the history of the Caribbean, no president or prime minister has drifted from one absurdity to another the way David Granger has. And in my conclusion, I think he's the most pathetic leader the British West Indies has produced. I, I know there were mediocre people in Antigua, Walters in Antigua, uh, there was Gary in Grenada, Bernard yeah. St. John in Barbados, uh, Chambers in Trinidad. They were basically self-effacing mediocre leaders. I think Donald Ramata didn't show any vision or any initiative, but you have to look hard within the community of the English-speaking Caribbean to find someone whose banality and intellectual vacuousness exceed David Granger. Uh, I think Granger has been the most embarrassment in the corridors of power in the post-colonial Caribbean. Right. Well said, sir. And ladies and gentlemen, that is indeed uh, an excellent analysis. And to borrow Mr. Kisun's phrase, it is now the ultimate in absurdity. Mr. Kisun, um, uh, you, sir, your, your view that you expressed two weeks ago, that uh, there is your opinion that Granger will not step down, even if he were to lose. I don't know if I've reflected that this correctly, is, but this, sir. This, I think, is um, the game plan. This, I think, is the game plan. They're okay. not going to accept the GCOM declaration, and they're mm -hmm. going to do that by saying this case is going to the Court of Appeal. Let's hear what the Court of Appeal says. This is the game plan. They are going to stay in there until some important person in the world, it could be the UN General Secretary, it could mm -hmm. be Jesse Jackson, it could be uh, Obama or, or, or somebody, or it could be some very powerful ex- uh, well, what, are thoughts, what are your thoughts of this? So they have recently started to bandy around that November United States election date. They are bandying that around under the premise that a change in government in the U.S. will see a softening of the position in Guyana. No, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for one reason. There is the U.S. government, though, no matter how powerful the Chinese government is, the Russian government, international relations it doesn't operate the way 
the ignorant people in the PNC sees it. Governments do not act on their own. They are alliance, every government a part of an alliance. China, uh, uh, North Korea, etc. Um, the Russians have their alliances too. A government will not make such a major decision without seeking um, the, the views of their um, alliance partners. And the EU and CARICOM will be the two sectors that the Biden presidency will consult and say, look, what, are, what is your position on Guyana? And Biden, when he comes into power, he's going to try to um, mend a lot of fences that uh, Trump has broken. So he's not going to unilaterally, unilaterally adopt a position on rigged elections in Guyana. He is not going to do that. You, you got to understand, these PNC people are very, very ignorant of the realities of the world. And one shudder to think, if they had won this election, what would have happened to Guyana's image? You have a black caucus of 59 black legislators in the U.S. House of Representatives. And they honestly believe that they could go to these people and tell these people a rich Indian aristocracy hired an American firm, rigged the election to keep out a black government. They are so ignorant in the age of, of the Internet that those people are going to say, uh-huh, that is what happened. Do you know not one black congresswoman or one black congressman has endorsed the election, quote-unquote, victory of Granger. Not one country in the Commonwealth. Now, those are things if Biden wins, and they hope uh, Biden is stupid. Well, they think more everybody's stupid. It, it isn't going to happen. This is what I think they're hoping for, and this is what I think may happen halfway, but it will collapse. They are going to stay in power despite a declaration by GCOM. And they're going to wait for someone. It could, be, it could be President Biden himself. It could be the UN General Secretary. It could be Michelle Obama. To say, look, bring these people to the table and let's talk. And in the discussion, the PNC is going to ask for an interim government until there's another election and until there's a change in the Constitution. I don't know if the PPP is going to accept that, but let us say the PPP accepts that. Down the road, there's going to be collapse. There's going to be collapse for two reasons. In no country in the world that has a, a, a plural system like Guyana, Belgium, Switzerland, Fiji, the Constitution guarantees an elect, electoral performer a substantial position in power. You, you get that position based on your return in the elections. Now, what the PNC is hoping to insert in the new constitution is a permanent role, a substantial permanent role in power that this, this thing must reflect, you, you know, the ethnic reality. That isn't going to work, and the constitutional framers aren't going to accept that. You will get a share of, in government based on the electoral returns. Now, if the PNC gets 15% in the next election, they cannot hope to get 50% of the government. And that is what they are, are, are hoping to achieve, a kind of 45, 50% government in a new constitution. No new constitution is going to embody the permanency of power without taking into consideration electoral performance, electoral capture of votes. So that right. is where the thing is going to collapse. Even if the PPP and the op other opposition parties agree for an interim government, change the constitution, etc., it the talks are going to collapse because the PNC's organic position is that there must be a substantial role for them in 
the near future, in the distant future. They could only be a substantial role for any political party in a constitution based on elections. In Northern Ireland, in Belgium, in Switzerland, in Fiji, you get into government automatically based on your returns in the election. And based on your returns in the election, that a quota of power is assigned to you. So nobody winning 15% of the votes are going to get 50% of the cabinet votes. Okay. And, 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 and you, uh, if, if, if I may, I, I need to jump in here. Freddie, following your thoughts that they don't want to give up, uh, 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 let's talk the scenario that you're using there. Coming back to GCOM, GCOM's uh, CEO, sorry, chairperson today, this justice, retired Claude Singh, via her uh, submissions uh, uh, through her lawyer, Kim Kite, is saying that uh, the CEO cannot be vested with any unfettered powers, and therefore, uh, if, if that happens, uh, he is going to uh, be more powerful than the commission, and she's asking the court to therefore throw out this case. Uh, let's assume that she accepts, um, uh, or there's some scenario that uh, there's a declaration. Are you saying that uh, there is going to be a recognized president in the form of Air Finale based on the recount votes, and they are going to have a refusal by the administration? That is uh, the coalition to refuse? Yes, I think they're going to argue that she could not have made that kind of declaration. And so they're going to say, we want to test that in court. And until that is tested, we will regard the uh, from Ali presidency as illegal. Well, then following your train of thought again. <laughs> Fred, you go down here. Yeah. Uh, but following your tra train of thoughts again, where is the army and the police going to stand in all of this? That is interesting. I, I don't think we have that kind of professionalism in the police force and in the army that they're going to break ranks with the government of the day. I, I have to give my opinion. And my opinion is, is boxed in, for want of a better word. In other words, it's either one or two things. It's either they're going to say, we stand by GCOM, GCOM has made a declaration, and therefore we do not recognize the Granger presidency. Or they say, the, the, government, the reality in the gong is that you have a president who is in power, Mr. Granger, and we are going to stick with that until an alternative situation arises. The, um, the army and the police have not been um, unprofessional in its relation with the civilian um, uh, um, government, but these are difficult, trying times. And though I cannot speak um, with any certainty about the army, I did use the word three times in my column about the push. Uh, the chairman word meaning a quick lightning uh, 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 takeover of power. I think mm -hmm. the the day, the day when that guy say Singh was the, the, was ejected. And the deputy assistant commissioner of police refused to eject him, citing professional ethics, and they moved him. It was clear to me that the police are not going to side with um, against Granger. Right. And, and Freddie, the, there is another issue, isn't there? Let, let us take the legal perspective, because not only the army will be caught smack down the center, the judiciary will as well. So. If the chairman declares an Ali win, an, an Ali um, presidency, um, the chancellor would be constrained, therefore, to follow course and have a swearing in. Um, therefore, the judiciary now will, I mean, who is really going to be president? And it means Granger will have to take command of the armed forces to, to really rule the country. I think, that, I think those two women, those two Jews, has, have done well for Guyana's image. I think although she voted for 34 being half of 65, um, I, I think the Chancellor and the Chief Justice have, have performed professionally and, and their, their decisions have been learned. Mm -hmm. My mind is the Chancellor is going to say, I have to follow the law. And GCOM made a declaration, I am going to swear in this guy. What is right. going to take over there is real politics. 
in any case, she, she's finished with it. She swears him in, and she's finished with it. She does not have access to, to power to make him um, de jure president. He will be right. de jure president, but she can't make him a practical president. So right. there is a lot of crises ahead. It is clear to my mind that when Granger used those words, that we will accept GCOM declaration, but based on law, he, I, what is going to happen is that they are never going to accept a declaration by GCOM because to stay in power, they have to reject GCOM's declaration. And they are staying in power, so you're going to have a systematic, continuous rejection of anything GCOM does. Do you believe that, that do you hell, so that, go ahead Glenn. sorry my apologies uh, there if I cook my host do you believe that the chancellor will play ball uh, will do the right thing let's assume that the uh, Gcom goes along uh, with the way of Irfan Ali uh, have a, there, there's a declaration there's a swearing in uh, or there is an instruction or a notice to the chancellor to step in there and do her job do you believe that she will do her job? Yes, I, I just said that. Yes, I, I think she would. I think. And I think she, she sees that as a ceremonial role. GCOM yes. invites her. She, as the head of the judicial system, for she to reject GCOM. Um, but, but Freddie, therein lies, the, 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 as you rightly say, then the nightmare truly starts. Because then the judiciary, having the chancellor declare somebody the head of the judiciary, right? Um, then the judiciary will have to then uh, um, uh, recognize, um, you know, not that they would, not that they would be a part of it. But then the, the problem gets even real, as to use your word again, that the, the world will now recognize a sworn-in president, which means Granger would occupy a, a, a building, but not not an office per se, where the world is concerned. It depends on it depends on the the social forces in Guyana. He is going to stay in power, and I think he's in power illegally at the moment, but he's still in yeah. power. But it's, it's, it's going to eventually collapse. But I, I believe the police and the army are going to use excuses to say, uh, this is the situation on the ground, and we're going to stick with the situation on the ground. Now, when those people went to see the army chief. Mm -hmm. They knew this was coming because they got their intelligence data that these people are not coming out. For all you know, maybe somebody high up in the echelons of the PNC have fed the information back to the U.S. Embassy that, look, we had a meeting and these people are not coming out at all. That's why she went and she met um, the army chief. What I believe may happen to put Granger and company out of power. What I believe may happen is that I don't think the Americans have spoken to them directly, and I don't think the Americans will say, listen, we are not tolerating this, and we are going to take drastic measures to remove you, and we are going to remove you, and that means physically. They may, the Americans may then give them a... a, a, a secretly a couple of weeks or, or what have you, or a couple of months, so they may ask for that, and then they, they, they may leave. I think but, there is some, some play yet remaining uh -huh. to stop the nightmare, and I think that's Americans. The Americans will never tolerate one of the most obscure, smallest group in South America and the Caribbean, defying them. No, maybe yeah, if it's... Maybe right. if yeah, it's right. maybe if it's strategic like um, Central America, if it's Costa Rica, Chile, even a Jamaica, or which Trinidad next to that lies next to Venezuela. No, they're not they're not gonna tolerate Guyana doing that because their credibility is at stake. You're talking about the superpower. Well Freddie, are we still obscure with oil? Uh, if we're still obscure with oil, uh well, I, I, I think that that oil puts us in a better economic position, but it doesn't make us a strategic geopolitical player in the world. 
uh, Ecuador, Ecuador has more. Ecuador has more. Not necessarily, Freddie. Let me interject here. There well, is, a, let, let there let is, there is a story. There is a story that come coming out today. Hold from... a minute. Hold a minute. Uh -huh. Before we get to the oil, let let's just let's just stretch this thing a little bit further. So, Freddie, uh, I want to take you back to what you said just now, uh, and that is the likelihood um, th that all the indications are showing that this is what they plan to do, sir. Um, today's Guyana Rag front page said, we will not bend. That is, Harmon is speaking, we will not bend. Um, going back to your point then, Mr. Kisun, will you, with your analytical mind, connect the dots backwards to say that they, this thing has long been in the play with Granger putting retired army persons in strategic, strategic positions all around the country? Well, I've, I've, I've said it on television, radio, and in my column several times. They, they thought that in 2015, they would have been a mesmerizing, electrifying, uh, a coruscating victory. And mm -hmm. then when the return came in, and they saw that they barely won, and maybe, maybe they didn't win, from 2015 onwards, they started the directions, mechanisms, strategies, stratagems to reenact Burnhamism, where mm -hmm. Burnham's philosophical approach to power, which is once you have it, you have to use it and use it for the, uti the utility of your constituency. This thing was there since 2015. And mm -hmm. I, I think what, what went wrong is they did not have the intellectual finesse and the strategic genius of, of Burnham. Uh, you may not like, you may not like a, 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 a leader, but you have to give him credit. Now take, for example, Barbara Jack Dio. I personally think Mr. Jack Dio is not a democratic guy with democratic instincts. Maybe he should change. But Bala Jack Dio has a strategic finesse. He, has, he is very, very articulate in, in, in persuading people, and he is very cunning and foxy in strategizing with the results that he out strategize his, his, his opponents. And that is where he's at today. He has lost uh, two consecutive elections. And his, his, his cunning and his strategic thinking have brought him back into power. So you may not like a person, but you have to give them credit if they possess a, a, a talent that is there. And I think Burnham was definitely a, a, a dangerously autocratic man. But Burnham had finesse. He knew how to strategize. In the middle of an ethnic crisis in Guyana, he invited Stokely Michael. He got an Indian uh, 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 legal doctor to, 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 to draft his constitution. He took a, 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 a lawyer married to a white woman to be his foreign minister and his attorney general, etc. Now, the people in power today in the PNC, when they sat down in 2015 to reenact Burnhamism, you can't reenact, you can't reenact Brian Lara or reenact Don Bradmon if the person isn't a genius as Lara or as Bradmon. You have to take a genius like Lara and you have the enactment of Brian Lara. Now, how could you take someone as Jejun, as Benal, as Harmon, Valde Lawrence, uh, mm -hmm. David Granger, uh, and a few others and say, listen, we're going to do what Forbes did in the 70s and 80s. You can't. <laughs> and that, that, is, that is the problem I think they're in today. And, and Freddie, while this is not uh, of ultimate importance, but the, the positioning and the sound bites, of course, uh, would have its own import. That is, um, Harmon today, 
uh, purportedly addressed the nation. Here is a chairman of a political party addressing a nation, yet the man who holds the constitutional position of president of this country has not done so. Well, I don't think it's, I don't think it's any big disagreement. I think, mm -hmm. I think Granger has been um, sidestepped, not in any confrontational way. Um, they're in the war room, and they would say, um, David, you leave this to me. David, you don't get involved in this. So in that sense, David is not, Granger is not totally in charge. But I think what they're trying to do, what Harmon is trying to do, and this is all strategy that goes back to the Roman Empire, very old strategy. Um, it was best e exemplified in Hamilton Green in the PNC and Janet Jagan in the PPP. What Chedi Jagan and Burnham did, they made very, very unpopular decisions. They castigated people wrongfully, but they didn't do it. It's Green that did it. And so we say Green is a bully. It's not Chedi that did it. It's Janet that did it. So we say Janet is a Stalinist, and Chedi remains as the nice guy. So all Harmon is doing is protecting this so-called nice image of Granger. Granger doesn't come across when speaking as a, as a James Bond or as a, a Sherrod Duncan, or, 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 as, or, as, or as Kermit Ramjitan. I mean, a really wild politician, very wild man, is Kermit Ramjitan. But Granger doesn't sound like that. So they want to keep that image. Now, you've got to understand, the more the PNC brutalizes uh, the Queen's language, the more they brutalize uh, vocabularies of the English language, the more they sung as bestial politicians. Granger is protected because it's not he that's coming across as a Harmon or a James Bond. Now, I think that explains why Harmon, you know, um, dictators, all of them, they put a fall guy. Yes, yes, indeed. Indeed. And Freddie, to come back to the point you were making, uh, Leonard, Freddie, the oil issue, I would want viewers and listeners to, to remember and to realize this. And, and for your comment, of course, when we talk about oil, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about contracts with powerful firms that, that Guyana's economy pales in significance to them. And, you know, Guyana tried for how much years? 30 years now to, to break a contract with an American telephone company that could not have done it. So whatever and whether Guyana's political problems, the people are going to continue to pump their oil and probably keep their money until there is a legitimate government. Over to you, Freddie. I, I can understand what um, uh, Leonard was saying, that now there's a newly all rich country, but it doesn't translate they are all rich countries richer than uh, Guyana and has more leeway in the world economy than Guyana, yet um, they don't have that kind of, of, of insertion in the geopolitics and the strategic shape of the world. Uh, um, Bruni, uh, Ecuador, they're all, all power. So, even though Guyana may be a newly found all power, it still doesn't and will not have that kind of importance to make countries, powerful countries like the EU and the US, turn a blind eye to their uh, uh, oligarchic bestialities as what's going on in Guyana. But it's not so much Guyana's importance that is at stake here. It's the credibility of the United States. And I don't think the PNC ignoramuses are seeing this. Look, in, in, in psychological politics, I lived in Grenada, I've seen this, and I think both of you, uh, Leonard and you, would know this. Once you make a decision as a CEO, as an army boss, as a president or a prime minister, once you take a definitive stand 
and you have a global clout. You box yourself in if you, if, you, if you don't pursue what you said you will do. Now, if the United States does not confront Guyana on its violation of democracy, some, they, they are 40, 30, 40 countries um, in, in South America and the Caribbean. Which one is going to say, listen, let's try this thing? Now, for all we know, for all we know, Bautise may have tried it if he didn't look at the relentless pressure coming on in Guyana. Suppose Bautise wanted to try it and he said, listen, um, look what happened in Guyana. I may not get you with this thing. And for all you know, I am wanted in Holland. You know, I better make a deal with my local people here. So he made a deal. He made a deal in that he agreed to a free and fair election. He handed over power, and I don't think they are going to extradite him. So uh, the, the United States and the EU are not going to allow a small, obscure country that they have pronounced is a rigor of election. They're not going to turn back like that. Your credibility is at stake. Now, take, for example, um, Mark Rubio. He is a senator in Florida. He, his, his office takes in Latin America and Caribbean affairs. Who is going to listen to Mark Rubio from other Central and Latin American countries? When this guy said, um, Mr. Granger lost election, he should step aside. And Mark Rubio just forget about it, and the dictatorship in Guyana remains. The, the, the thing is too far gone for the United States, for CARICOM, and the EU to back down. But more importantly, once Granger is allowed to stay in CARICOM, some other CARICOM country is going to rig the election, bash up the country, and CARICOM can't say anything. And then in the next five years, Another CARICOM country is going to say, Guyana do it, Xanadu country do it, let's do it. And you're talking about the demise of CARICOM. No. When all the configurations, permutations, directions are taken into consideration, I think Granger has lost, the PNC, the AFU have lost, and it's only a question of time. And well, Freddie, I want to stretch. I want to stretch you back a little bit. Now, uh, uh, the, back to the ar the argument, um, you know, on the option that if if Granger decides, well, you know, the, the likelihood is he would stay in office regardless of how this goes. The chancellor would then swear in Ali. The army is caught in a quandary. But one of our viewers just sent in this word: if the chancellor swears in Ali, Ali immediately becomes the commander in chief, and therefore the army would be under usual circumstances, be constrained to follow the word of the commander-in-chief. Over to you, sir. Well, well, in political theory, you have de jure power and de facto power. Yeah. Once they mm -hmm. swear in Ali, he is de jure president. Right. But then you have the mm -hmm. concept of real politics, practical politics. If you swear in Ali, and he is the de jure president, you have an illegal president that still commands raw, raw power, which the army concedes is uh, the power that they're going to abide by, then I think what you, what you have is a continuation of uh, an illegal regime. What happens then is what we can debate. But there's no question that if the army and the police do not recognize the jure power, then Granger remains in office with his outriders and with his public sector chiefs in the public sector and the army and police chief taking directions from him. And, and by then we have no economy. Who's going to pay? I mean, that's not for this discussion, but just for the viewers and listeners. Freddie, um, if, if I may step aside from the politics for a moment, um, just to bring our viewers and listeners up to date. Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday, July 16th would have been an, a sad anniversary of the um, shooting to death of those two boys in Berbice. 
Mr. Jagan Ramasar and Bolanat Parmanan for the 1973 elections, which you would recall, and this is why I raised this uh, to seek Freddie's input once again on this. A week ago, um, Granger's page would have um, laid that at the feet of um, Carl Morgan, which I think the entire nation was taken by shock that a sitting president would have on his um, 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 Facebook page, Freddie, um, such a statement that Carl Morgan would have been the uh, administrative officer in charge when those two boys were shot. And today, of course, I believe is the anniversary of the Michael Ford um, bombing that would have taken place. Over to you, Freddie. I, I think we, we need, when this matter is settled, I think we need to do some serious research into Granger's background during the 70s. I am not convinced that Granger and Harmon knew nothing about the um, Walter Rodney assassination. Harmon was the chief of intelligence, and Harmon had to know uh, what was what was going on. He had to know because the army was intricately involved in the plot. What, what I think is shameless on the part of the PPP, I don't know if the next government is the PPP, and I would hope we've, we, we, ha we have a road to Damascus scenario here where the PPP would have seen that they messed up very, very badly immorally and in degenerate ways. That Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry, the report points a finger of the involvement to kill Walter Rodney by a certain man who is very, mm -hmm. very, a certain high-level military guy who is very, very close to the PPP. Now, I, I believe that guy, I, I don't want to call his name. The problem is I could call his name because the Commission of Inquiry report is online. But, but Yog, who is to stop him from suing Kaicho Radio and me tomorrow? And I got to climb the court steps. So those who want to know his name, please go online, punch in Walter Rodney Commission, and you will see what they have to say about him and Skip Roberts. Uh, so... I, I have no doubt in my mind that Joe Harmon would not have been a non-interested party during those events. Now, what is interesting to note is that recently, actually uh, the 12th of June, which is just a month ago, Walter Rodney's daughter managed to secure 20... Um, before then classified documents from the U.S. government on the Rodney assassination. And in one of those documents, Burnham is speaking frankly, quite frankly, to the U.S. ambassador. Now, the things Burnham said to that ambassador, it, it, when you read what he said to the ambassador, the army people had to know because Burnham was saying things that he knew Rodney was doing. And the army people had to know. So I am not surprised at um, um, what Granger did. I don't have a Facebook account, what Granger did in terms of Morgan. But I would think that Granger in the 70s was not such an innocent bystander that Guyana's historiography uh, is claiming him to be. Uh, I think we need to do much more research on that guy because his obsession with Forbes Burnham and the role he played as the ideological educator for the army. I mean, he, used to, he was actually in charge of the education classes, the political classes, not education classes, political classes for the army. It would have brought him very close to Burnham. So my point is I am not surprised at the Carl Morgan embrace. Right. And the, the Joe, I'm sorry, um, um, Leonard, my last one and then over to you. And the Joe Singh, um, he is hit out quite harshly 
sharply and repeatedly at Zo Singh. He took absolute umbrage to Zo Singh using the terms um, the do unleashing the dogs of war. The reason I ask you that, Freddie, is as of today, they, I, we have seen some, I believe, is ominous statements. I don't know what you would think, sir, coming out from certain persons. So, for example, on, on Ronald Austin Jr.'s page, he has, uh, he has shared what is purportedly a letter from Vincent Alexander, Commissioner Vincent Alexander. The last sentence of that letter reads as follows. But regime change was achieved, thousands killed, and Iraq is yet to return to stability and civility. For me, Freddie, that is a little chilling statement coming from a commissioner. But over well, to you, sir. Well, you on Facebook, so you, you uh, read that. I think David Hines is saying much more explicitly. Uh, that is couch in innuendos and insinuations. But David mm -hmm. Hines is much more forthright by saying the population isn't going to accept that. You're going to have trouble, etc. It yeah. could be, it could be that, it could be two things, Yog. It could be the Burnham trait of if I fall, then this place, um, you know, the being a mess. It could be that if there is regime change, they are going to use street violence to push them to the bargaining table. So if they feel that way, then uh, sadly and pessimistically, I hope your views don't start being sad. There is going to be um, street violence because if it's a modus operandi to gain you a seat at the negotiating table, then in terms of real politics, they're going to use it. Secondly, it could also be sounding off in this violent way to scale uh, the PPP to scale um, other uh, stakeholders like the business people because once you have street violence, the business people stand to lose. I am not too sure the street violence of the 70s and 80s with the PNC goons and the House of Israel. I am not too sure it's going to work that way. I think there's going to be collateral damage mutual collateral damage, or there's going to be collateral damage on both sides, way from 1962 to 1997. There was collateral damage on only one side, and they are thinking that they're invincible and that they could pull off from 1962 to 1997 again. No, it's, 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 it's different. The world has changed beyond recognition from 1962, 1964, 1997. No. You, I think the PNC has the capacity to create an unnerving moment, but to, but to dominate Guyana with relentless violence, without collateral damage to themselves. I can't, I can't, see, I can't see it happening without collateral damage being done to the PNC. This is... Right a different world, and there are people out there with enormous resources that a super calculator cannot even calculate their resources. Yes, and thank you very much for that. Freddie, the people that are online that is watching the show and listening, they said that you have a, fa you have a Facebook account, but uh, uh, you, you're trying to say that you don't have one. But in any case, it has well, a I name on never, it. I have, <laughs> never denied, I have never denied anything that I do in life, and the reason for that is I would like to know who can get me, mm -hmm. who can get me to hide what I believe in. Right. If I believe Brian Lowry is a fool, if I believe Obama is a fool, I am going to say that and put my name. So maybe, but you, you don't think any other way, maybe some fan of mine. Right, you have a fan, you have a fan. For me. Right, right. I, I, think, I think you should investigate it, but I think you should also get yourself a smartphone. Well, can't you do that for me? I got a smartphone. You have Lolo, a smartphone? Lolo sent me a smartphone. <laughs> when I opened it up, it, the wires were rigged and it had a phallic symbol. It came from Lolo. All right, I, I, I'm not going to co uh, continue with this conversation anymore. But, Freddie, well, there, there's a development. Freddie, there's a development today. Freddie, I think you, you have a fake account. You, yes, I have a white pants. You like it? Red, R E D red. <laughs> yes, I do, I do. Uh, Freddie, there's a development today um, that Guyana 
one day after it was announced that several persons uh, within the coalition were slapped with uh, uh, visa revocations, and we have a new term now, by the way, visa uh, uh, revokies, I think it is. Uh, I hope Yog is not a revokie, but um, there, uh, one day after that would have happened, there's news coming out from Gordon Mosley's uh, news source, and this is what it had to say. The Guyana government has refused a request by the United States. Oh, oh I heard about that. Right. Um, um, there that is, is not, that is not, uh, that is not possible. If you're going to have that kind of thing, it'd be better to put... Well, let the people let them know what it is if you missed it. Uh, there yeah, yeah. is reportedly a request by the U.S. Uh, they have written to our Washington uh, embassy and to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here for Guyana to, to be used uh, uh, spectrums and so on to transmit the Voice of America radio uh, signals there. And the Guyana government has refused, stating that uh, they don't want to do anything that is going to, um, you know, uh, uh, destabilize the situation with uh, Venezuela. But Leonard, uh, but but Leonard just Freddie comes in. Um, Freddie, uh, just one thing I want to uh, add there before your comment. So the request would have been dated April this year. The, the, the communication from the ministry and so forth is April this year. But this rigging of this election is March this year. And, and the U.S. ambassador and everybody would have been on record since early March. And so the narrative they're trying to push that that is because they, 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 they told the U.S. no, that the U.S. is now doing all of this. Over to you, back. Well, analysts, mm -hmm. analysts, if they respect their education, the first thing they do they look at who is bringing this information out. And when it's Gordon Mosley, you see, I regard people like Mosley, Lincoln Lewis, Henry Jeffrey. I regard them as the surrogates who are doing the nefarious work for Granger and company. So instead of Granger saying this, they are going to say it for him. But I, I, I think one of the problems human beings have is to know when to engage in a polemic and who to engage it with. I, I am not going to comment on some uh, uh, masturbation by God Mosley. I don't consider him, uh, I consider him one of the chief, pro chief propagandists in situations like this. And you, 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 you are going to have every scenario like this, the past, couple hundred of years have produced cheap propagandists like God mostly. So if we can get on with analyzing more important people who are doing the, the work for the PNC, I would prefer to go in that direction. No, no, well, I was just asking about the timing of it, uh, whether, uh, uh, well, if you don't want to discuss that, that's okay. Well, then we bring you to another angle here. Selwyn Peters, attorney at law, who would have played a role in the Walter Rodney CEO? Yeah, yeah, I know him personally. Very good. I didn't ask you that, sir. But he said in room 592 that the APNU would not risk the existence as a coalition by exposing that very detailed report. I want to ask your, your thoughts on that, sir. What, uh, uh, let me get that again. Okay, uh, Selwyn Peters, he would have yeah. played a role in the Walter yeah. Rodney yeah. COI, and he would have expressed the, the, um, uh, his thoughts, st stating in Room 592 here, that uh, the APNU coalition did not, uh, he believed that they, they would not have wanted that report to come out because of what it would have exposed. Your thoughts? Well, the report, the report is out. Whether they would not have wanted it to come out is another thing, but he's right. Because they, they stake the claim, they believe, I think Lincoln Lois' wife, uh, who writes letters under the name of Minute Backus, she said, look, let the commission, she's one of the strongest fanatical PNC that, since in the history of the PNC. She said, let the commission go ahead because it's going to exonerate Burnham. And they believe that 30 years plus, it, there would have been obfuscations and um, um, esoteric discussions, and nothing would have come out of it. But the evidence pointed to, um, um, to Burnham involvement. And it, I, I think it is 
quite sad that someone of the caliber and importance of someone like Jerry Gavaya, you know, one of the things, let me divest here. I, I, I got a call from Kit Nascimento this morning, and he asked me for the documents that were released by what he was his daughter. I think the difference with Kit Nascimento and someone like Jerry Gavaya. Now, I, want, I was in Kaicho Radio for two weeks interviewing Jerry Gavaya, and I think Mr. Gavaya has played no small part. Mr. Gavaya has played an essential, emphatic, priceless role in stopping rigged election. I, 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 I think that will go down in the textbook. But the difference with Gavaya and Kit Nascimento, Kit Nascimento said, look, I was with these people. I know what these people have done. I have seen these people rig elections. I think um, Jerry Gavaya needs to put to rest for the next generation and for young people like yourself, uh, Leonard, as to what happened with the Rodney's um, um, assassination and the, the man who killed Rodney, Gregory Smith. I think Jerry has done sufficient to redeem himself. And I do believe as a captain in the army, he uh, was told to, order to fly someone out, and he did that. He couldn't tell, but now I'm not flying the man. But, but he owes it to history. He owes it to young people like you, Gildari, and the young intellectuals that are coming up to say, listen, this is what I, I know of the Rodney assassination. Now, this is what I believe. I believe Jerry flew out Gregory Smith. Um, and Jerry said in the Commission of Inquiry, he didn't know who he was flying. That is not true. Um, there is a very, very important person in the, in the AFC. That person was uh, a trainee engineer that was cleaning the aircraft and fixing the aircraft up when Jerry and um, Gregory Smith were talking. Now, I, 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 I have a lot of respect for Jerry, so I can say this. I don't think he would sue me. Um, so, um, and, and saying that he knows it was Gregory Smith doesn't mean that I'm libeling him. And I, I, I hope if he's listening, I don't mean any and any harm. I've, I've spoken positively of him, and I don't intend to denigrate him. I would not. Uh, the, the, the Jerry Gavaya of 2020 has taken his place as, as a Democrat. But to get back to Selvin Peters, yes, I don't think they, they wanted that to come out. But I'm glad you raised the topic, Gildari, because in discussing Rodney, we, there are implications of the con the moral and psychic contortions of this society, which perhaps have no parallel in the 21st century. To think that Rupert Rupnerine voted in Parliament not to release that report. Um, so the, the, the Rodney Commission of Inquiry not only exposed Burnham's role in it and exposed Granger not wanting to... Um, the report, but it also shows mm -hmm. uh, the kind. But I, I, I think you, I, I, I think as Yog was talking about Joe Singh and how they reacted to Joe Singh, um, David Granger does not like Joe Singh because Joe Singh was appointed above him. But mm -hmm. David Granger doesn't like Rupert Rupnerine, and that's why I find Rupert Rupnerine's position extremely weird in a negative sense, because I think Granger, Granger doesn't like the WPA because Granger and Harmon knew what the WPA were doing in the 70s. He right. was head of military intelligence. So I wasn't surprised when Granger mistreated um, Rupert Rupnerine. First, he made him Minister of Natural Resources. He was photographed with his long boots, visiting a collapsed mining pit in which 11 miners died, and then suddenly became Minister of Education. Then he was unceremoniously dumped 
as Minister of Education and given a portfolio in the Public Service Ministry. He didn't have a desk or a chair. He, he, he worked at home. So right. um, the Rodney Commission of Inquiry has brought out a lot, of, a lot of things that just show how tragic this country is. Yep, yep, indeed. Um, Freddie, if we come back to these elections, because undeniably, uh, fortunately, or un maybe fortunately for them, unfortunately for the country, the APNO AFC, in whatever they're doing, they have held on strongly. A bunch of very old men, especially the president, he is, he is not anywhere in his prime anymore, but they have held on strongly to some younger men that has been uh, spewing quite some dangerous rhetoric every day. And so going back to what you theorize at the top of the program, that a Granger government will not give up this presidency, the likelihood is that time will overtake Mr. Granger sooner or later. And um, what then if, if they continue to want to stay in power? Well, well tragically and sad, I think we're witnessing the demise of the PNC. What, what, my goodness, I can't, I don't know why we keep coming back to the comparison of Burnham and, um, mm -hmm. and Granger. Mr. Burnham rigged elections glaringly, egregiously, barefacely. But once he was in power, he did things that obfuscated his naked uh, 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 proclivities of hogging power that he got Chedi Jagan in 1976 to declare critical support. Then he got Chedi Jagan in 1984 to have talks of power sharing. So um, Burnham survived because he was, he was a thinker. Um, I also do not believe Burnham was stupid enough to carry the fight against Indians. Once Jagam was there, Indians would not have embraced Burnham. But there were certain, there were certain things that Burnham did that if he was not such uh, uh, obsessed with himself, he could have gained Indian support. I think the MMA, that MMA thing w was very good for rural farmers. The Ibini mm -hmm. ranch thing, the cattle thing. But the thing with Granger is that uh, he is so mediocre and the people around him that what you are facing here with now is the eventual collapse of the PNC. Now, here is what I think is going to be the shape of uh, post-2020 Guyana. One, Granger is going to resign. Two, the people likely to uh, succeed him is not going to have any kind of respect from the business community, from the intellectual class, and from the African middle class. The people that is going to rally along that leader are people themselves that will be detested by the society, the James Bond, the, the, um, uh, um, that, those, those kinds of people. The AFC will be gone. That, that, that's, that, that's, yeah. that's fairly obvious. The, the AFC yeah. will be gone. So, why the stakes are so high? Why they are so pathologically aggressive? Because unlike Jack Dio in 2011, and unlike Jack Dio in 2015, they knew, Jack Dio and the PPP knew, that the PPP was going to be alive in 2020 and fighting like hell to regain its position. And in fact, Jack Dio did regain his position. What position is the PNC hierarchy going to regain? Secondly, right. that little oil wealth is going to bring in money that you can use to win over constituencies. Now, I, I believe people like Juan Edgel, um, Philip Hamilton, uh, the Prime Minister, uh, those guys are going to be given leverage to do things for the African Guyanese community. Now, here is the difference. Burnham and Jagan used to buy Indians and Africans respectively in the government, and people 
never really supporting them because the blacks felt that um, that was Jagan buying over Stooge. The Indians felt that was Burnham buying over yeah. Stooge. I think this time it's going to be different. This time you're going to have an exhausted African constituency. You're going to have a, a dying PNC. And I think African Guyanese are going to look to salvage their future. And they're probably going to deal with Mark Phillips. And if Mark Phillips is astute enough, he should reach out to them in genuine ways. And I, I believe that is going to happen. I don't know Jack Dio. I don't know his temperament. He may be a recalcitrant man, but not an Inandalal. Not, I, I think, an, you know, I, I, do, I do acknowledge that often Ali has done well. He will be the next president of Guyana. He has a PhD from UWI. His supervisor was a professor of Padai. But I cannot bring myself to think that the next president would, from the PBC would not be an Inandalal. I mean, but it's gone. He's not going to be the president. But I think Nandalal has a more sobering effect on PPP's politics. He's a, the kind of guy who reaches out more. Um, I can see the same for some of the young players. Leonard Galdavi would know them. They were in the studio with us. They're pretty young people who are going to be given position. Take, for example... Sanjeev Dattadin. I can't see Sanjeev Dattadin just being a, a, a yes man for Jack Dio and just saying, you oh, know, this, this is Indian people time. That, that's not the Sanjeev Dattadin right. I know. So you, you're really facing, you, this country is really facing the demise mm -hmm. of the PNC because they have, the Greenwich is gone, but even if Greenwich stays, I don't think Greenwich is any, um, any charismatic visionary leader. When you look at the PNC, who do you have? If you look at the new movement, if you look at Anug, there are far greater potential there, both in terms of vision and intellectual strength. And you, you don't see that in the PNC. But finally, more importantly, what the PNC has done to this country the past four months, there's going to be indefatigable, inflexible anger that is going to last a very long time. And that is going to be to the detriment of the, those young people aren't going to forget what they did. Because what they did exceeded what Burnham did. Exceeded right. far, far more. I mean... We're into the fourth month, and people just feel George Song is going to be burned down because the PNC think they have a right to rule Guyana forever. When you think of that, how could you forgive such a party in another year or two? So right. I would like to think that the, 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 the most painful tragedy when this crisis is over is that a historic party like the PNC may not survive. And, and that is a sad thing because, um, uh, you know, uh, Freddie, what happens to uh, a strong opposition? Because one would remember the pre-2015 things that, I mean, everybody was, a lot of persons were opposed to. And without a strong opposition, we can very well quickly end up there again. Well, even, well, see, that is the problem the four-month crisis has produced. Even yes. with a strong opposition, if the PP is going to be kept in check, it will have to be done by that one solitary parliamentarian, because given the mental state of this society, with what's been going on, the PNC is going to lose the potency of the word. They're going to lose the power of the pen, because they're going to be judged by four months of the Faustian journey into dark subterranean monsters that eat us up. That is how people are going to judge them. It's going to take a cataclysmic, volcanic implosion by the PNC in which degeneracy will not be the right word to use for the PNC to resurrect themselves 
and outdo the PPP as an opposition party. And I don't think with all his bad behavior, I don't think Jack Dio is, is, is going to be that recidivist. And I don't think the young people in the party are going to allow him to just run amok. I can't see Sanjeev Dattadin, Mark Phillips, and Anil just allowing Jack Dio to do what uh, I think he may dominate Anil, but he may not dominate the, 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 the cabinet or, um, or the, the government. So you have a problem there with them even being in the opposition. Look, whoever succeeds Granger, it's going to be one of three persons. I think in terms of delegates voting, it's either going to be Valda Lawrence, Basil Williams, or Harmon. You could imagine one of those three persons commanding respect in the National Assembly and commanding respect in the diplomatic community and among the young intellectual class. That's true. And, and Freddie, would, would you, uh, what's your thoughts? Two of those three names are purportedly um, uh, dual citizens. Um, they have said that they, they would have tendered their withdrawal, but it never was proven to GCOM or anybody. Who are the three? Who are the two? I only know of um, I only know of um, Lil Joe, Joe Shiling. Oh my goodness. I don't, Valde Lawrence, a dual citizen? Well, there are, there are, there are suspicions. You see, you could get away with that because under U.S. privacy law, you can't. Mm -hmm. But I think they, I think they are very smart lawyers in the U.S. that can tell. Who, it 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 is possible that the PPP is not interested in paying high price consultants to find out who is a citizen, because maybe they feel they got their own um, skeletons yes. in the cupboard too. Don't trust the PPP. They may have people right there and then they miss it as dual citizen. Um, one of the things we keep forgetting, and I would like to emphasize, what happened on March the 2nd concerns the future of this country and concerns your spouses and your children. Both of you are on this mm -hmm. radio program. It was our country. I've been fighting to get free and fair elections since March the 2nd. I think Lenal Gildari and Yog Mahadeo doing the same for this country we're going to live in. Unfortunately, some people see it as PPP versus PNC. I don't right. see it as such. So um, it's not about the PPP. It's about, yeah. it's about our country. But um, one has to be reminded that the PPP was no good guy. Uh, I think we have to have free and fair election. A bad man in Hungary won it. A bad man in the Philippines won it. A bad man in Poland won it. A bad man yeah. in the United States won it. Uh, a disheartening character in the UK won it. But they fought the election and won. Who is there in the world to tell them, oh God, we must show the man in Poland. Look what that crazy guy doing in Brazil and in the Philippines. But how could you get the army to overthrow them, the army take power, and you don't have free and fair election anymore? What you have to do is fight them. And the Brazilians are fighting Bolsonaro. I don't think he's, his presidency is, is going to last the, 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 the five years. So let us have a free and fair election, and if Jack Dio win again, we will have to confront him if he go the wrong way. And that is what democratic societies yeah. do. I never saw this thing, and I doubt whether the two of you ever saw it, as PNC versus PPP. That is what That's people like Lincoln Lewis and Jack Dio saw. It. They saw it as Indian versus um, uh, Africans. I saw this guy, he's versus the, 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 the bandits in the PNC, in the AFC. And before you come in again, I'd like you guys to know, um, well, I, since these programs are being recorded, I'd like it to be stated in years from now that I think they're equal bandits in the AFC as they are in the PNC at the moment. <laughs> Thank you for that. And Freddie, I want to uh, come a full circle here. Now, I mentioned to you a uh, quote 
quoted to you what Vincent Alexander, part of his letter that was released today. In response, says Gunraj has released and says Gunraj has said what my colleague has deliberately ignored, but in fact appears to countenance, is the insidious fraud perpetrated by Clearman Mingo, and he advocates the use of declarations based upon the same. Um, if, if you could focus a little bit on the commission itself, uh, uh, Freddie, from the following perspective as well. Um, we know Vincent Alexander um, uh, has been here for many, many, many years. But we also know um, that Mr. Corbin, one of the, the uh, one of the commissioners, Robert um, Corbin, has yeah. has overseas interest um, um, from his own personal standpoint. Um, so how how does that leave with this threat of sanctions? And would a Corbin not want to to look at what sanctions could mean to him if he's a green card holder? Well, he may be. He may be. Well, you have to understand groupthink in Guyanese politics and loyalty. There are times when people forsake their resources because of coercive demands from loyalty by the, um, by the, the upper echelons. Um, the examples of that are numerous in the Nazi regime Hitler. Um, Hitler was extracting loyalty from people to the detriment of their own family and their own businesses. Um, the one man who didn't accept that was Rudolf Hess, and he took a plane through to Scotland and tried to end the war. Now, um, uh, um, by the way, just as an aside, when we're in the radio station, <laughs> I just felt uh, I wanted to say this just to cool the temperature down. When we're in the radio station in an Algadari, that guy that is known as Critic, he, he mistakenly thought that Germany won the Second World War. I hope he doesn't object to me bringing in that. But um, yes, with our first, um, just um, didn't um, felt that his interests should come below um, Hitler. So, so Corbyn may be taking instructions from his brother saying, listen, this is time to hold uh, the fort. Um, I want to get into analysis here to explain why Corbyn may look at loyalty in place of his business interests and what is happening with this election. I think there's a theoretical aspect to what is going on the past four months that we need to discuss. And I, I, I feel guilty as an academic coming on these programs and not talking about it. I believe there's a genuine fear in people like Vincent Alexander, David Hines, the PNC, um, people like Raphael Chotman, Kathy Hughes, that this election marks the end of African entitlement. I do believe on a strict, using strict economic terminologies, economic and financial terminologies, I think African people are disadvantaged in this country. How you go about that is through policy making. Burnham went about it by Land to the Tiller Act, an acquisition of Land Act, in which he forcefully took people land, as you can see now where um, um, the land outside of UG there at the, at the traffic lights. Um, I believe there is a case for African entitlement. I believe there's a genuine fear that when the PPP comes back, that is how they feel. And I think it really exists in their mind that when the PPP come back, Argonne Lake. Now, Gildavi wouldn't know what, what Argonne Lake means. I think Yogi or Betul, you may know that. That's a famous statement <laughs> in Guyanese history. When the hotel wasn't supposed to be born down, but it burned down, and the people burned it down, say Argonne Lake. So they feel Argonne. That may be a theoretical validity. And that may be a sociological pronouncement that has to be made at the negotiating table. But that is no substitute for wanting permanent PNC rule because permanent PNC rule involves monstrous and horrible consequences. Let's, let's take the declaration of the fire in 1976. I can't imagine 
anything more morbid masturbation as what Burnham did at the Sapphire uh, uh, PNC headquarters in 1976 at his Congress base. Burnham could not win a free and fair election. Burnham's constituency was 35% of the population. And that man announced to Guyana and the world that his party that represents 35% will now be the paramount institution over law, over other social institutions, over other political institutions in Guyana. Do you know what happened, what would have happened on, December, on March the 4th if Mingo's masturbation like Burnham had taken hold? With 29% of the population, you would have, a, you would have had a party that caters to 29% of the population running this country for the next 600 years. Your grandchildren and my grandchildren would only know about one party, the PNC party, which is what happened to the babies that were born after 1968. By 1988, when you had Desmond Hoyt, those 20-year-old kids only know about the PNC. So, even if there's a case for ethnic distribution of resources, it has nothing to do with rig elections, and that is something to put on the agenda with whichever government comes to power. Let us talk about ethnic redistribution. Let us um, um, Look at the police force because Indians are insecure. Let us look at land holding and what Africans have. But you cannot say that Africans will be disenfranchised. So let us take control of the country permanently. And that is what Mingo and Lowenfield and the PNC and AFC were going to do on March the 4th. So in the next five years, you would have Lowenfield still there. You would have Myers still there. The election would have been rigged in more surreptitious circumstances, and that takes us to 2025. 2030, Lone Field is going to be 75. Um, Myers is going to be in the 60s, and they're doing the same thing. That is right. what Harold Bollers and Forbes Burnham did okay. in 1968, and that is why this election is so crucial to the physical and psychological existence of every human in this country. Every okay. one of us. Yog okay. has children. Yildari has children. And when you guys are taking out your sandwich in, 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 from your rucksack and sitting in the corridor of UG with, uh, doing your degree, all you can hear about, oh, the PNC minister opened this factory in Linden. Oh, yes, and then yes, you said yes. to yourself, this is the same minister when I was a baby at my factory in Suzdike. No, this election is not about African Indian entitlement. This uh, philosophy, is, this election is about philosophical freedom to exist. That is what it is about. So Alexander yes. and the rest of people like David Hines have to allow a free and fair election and then go to the table and put on, on the table the genuine grievances of African Guyanese. But what David Hines did more than anybody else except James Bond is say, either you have a PNC victory or this it. Right. And indeed, that is the new thing being posted now. One of the prime persons uh, that has no moral compass anymore has posted that um, it's either the country or, or, or a war. It's country or nothing. And that's the new thing. Freddie, we are running out of time. No, no. Somebody we are said getting that on Facebook. Stage. Sorry? Somebody said that on Facebook. Yes, yes. And um, we, so are, we are running, unfortunately, out of time, my friend. Facebook is uh, perfect. You should name him. <laughs> I'll send it to you. I'll, let me find the quote and no, I'll send it to you. No, don't send it to me. If you can say that on Facebook, it's public uh, let because me, you know it. Let me tell people it. Sure. Tell people who his name is. Let I me verify my sources first. But ladies and gentlemen, we are coming down to, to program time. And uh, Freddie, I'm sorry. 
um, we are coming out to program time. We have to bring an end because there's other programs to follow. Um, the court case is not ending on Sunday as we previously thought. It's gone over to Monday, and so we're going to move our program away from Sunday as, as well so that you can have a good weekend. Hopefully, everybody can have a very restful weekend. And, uh, you know, certainly we're looking forward for um, Mr. Kisun. Can I invite you from now for a next Friday night discussion again um, on room five, in room 592 here? Yeah, by, that, with, by, uh, that time, by that time, then, uh, Jadari may come to my home as he said he will with his smartphone. I will throw it in the trench, in the trench that the PPP refused to clean by my house there. <laughs> yes, I remember that story. What, what an incorrigible <laughs> man. Leonard, please get it done by next Friday. We need I to don't want Leonard to get down to my house with a smartphone. <laughs> I, we seem to be doing quite well. But in any case, he's going to ask Leonard to buy it and he's going to bring it. But um, <laughs> I'm you. putting fun aside. No, I am I'm quite... I'm quite happy to be doing this. I think that is our obligation, as we said before. This never happened in Guyana, and all of us now have to stand up and be counted. So I'm quite happy. Just, just call me. Just call me. Thank you yes, very much. Will do. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so very much for joining us here in Room 592. And do have a great weekend. And as I usually remind you every night, please do a prayer for this country. It is still the best country in the world. And let us all remember where there is intolerance and hate, let us be tolerant. And let us ensure that, that, that in our own hearts and minds and practice, there is no racism or hate for each other. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend ahead to you, to my co-hosts, and to the Kaito Radio Technical crew, Kevin, Rad, Josh, and everybody there. Have a great weekend. Do have a safe, great weekend, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Freddie Kiston, to you and your family, a warm and good weekend to you, sir. To my beautiful wife, Anita, Arya Yoga, and all of you, great weekend. Bye-bye now, everyone. Be safe.